we are in the midst of a grace awakening, which is linked to a love awakening, hence the unconditional love series, joy awakening, peace awakening, God awakening. And I'd encourage everyone to embrace the awakenings as they're happening in your own life and around you. This was a quote that I saw online. The grace tsunami covering the planet is not producing teachers, but awakeners of which you are one. And I believe if you're listening to me today and you're part of the Patreon group and what God is doing in these days, we want to help people awaken to the truth of who God is and the truth of who they are in a way that they become free from the restrictions in their lives so they can really discover their true identity and their true destiny in God. Um, I'm not here to teach you anything. My goal is to awaken you to who you've always been and to what you've always had, but simply did not know. I think that was Don Keithley. Uh, another quote, and this is guys from Bishop Jean Robinson, who I think officiated at one of our royal weddings. Um, it says, isn't it funny that you can preach a judgmental and vengeful and angry God and no one will mind, but you start preaching a God that's too accepting, too loving, too forgiving, too merciful, too kind, and you're in trouble. And I think that is often the case because there is such a conditioning to a view of who God really is that people really struggle when they get presented with the, the true gospel and the true message of God's love. John 12, 47 says, if anyone hears my words and does not believe. Now, generally, if someone said that, you imagine there's a consequence going to be spelt out for not believing. But this is what it goes on to say. I do not judge him for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So he's not judging him for not believing. But God does judge all of us. And that verdict is not guilty. That verdict is righteous. That verdict is justified. Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And everyone was lost. The whole of mankind was lost. And therefore he came to seek all of us and to save all of us. Um, and I'm going to go into a number of alls a bit later. So the word lost implies ownership. You can't lose something if you don't first own it. The lost sheep belong to the shepherd. The coin belong to the lady searching for it. I love how the Trinity is brought into this parable. Jesus, our shepherd, found the lost sheep. The woman, Holy Spirit, Ruach, in feminine form, found the lost coin. And the father found the lost son. God is family. Father, son, spirit, family, relationship, perichoresis, circle of intimacy. Amazing to enter into that circle and live from being within that circle by knowing that experience and that experience being the foundation to our lives. When the Father's unconditional love becomes your place of rest, then you move from doing to being and begin to manifest the reality of your sonship. Sonship manifests out of a relationship by grace and salvation is realized as a free gift, not earned. Salvation is not a transaction, not a business deal that pays off a legalistic deity behind the back of Jesus. Faith is not a surcharge, the one requirement left for getting our paperwork stamped as holy in some abstract divine courtroom. A contract contains an offer and an acceptance of the offer. A covenant remains in effect even if one party breaks the covenant. We have preached contract and called it covenant. And I think that's a, an important fact to look at. What we looked at in terms of salvation is if I do this, God will do this. And in reality, the covenant was made not with us, but with Jesus. Salvation is a covenant. God's commitment to us to rescue us from the disease of sin and the self-destruction of death. We didn't need punishment. We needed a whole new operating system to view life from a totally different perspective the perspective of grace and unconditional love. So the new covenant was made between the father and the son, and you are a beneficiary. So just say thank you and stop trying to complete what he said is finished. And I think a lot of my life, I was trying to complete what he'd already finished because that was what I was taught needed to be done. Now, therefore, I tried to be obedient. I tried to love God. I tried to please God. I tried to do all those things as if they were a law that I needed to follow. And God began to deconstruct my thinking and challenge me over those type of beliefs 
showing me that I still had old covenant thinking, even though I had experienced God, there was still something deeper within me that needed to be deconstructed. And therefore he started to ask me questions about, you know, are you trying to be obedient? And of course I said, yes, you know, and then I realized that that wasn't the right answer. Um, wasn't the answer that, that he wanted me to give, but I gave it because I was being honest. And then he said, you know, are you, are you trying to please me? And of course I said, yes. Are you trying to love me with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength? Yes. But then he showed me that those were the things that were the best you could do under the law. But when the work of Christ was finished, all of that stuff was was no longer in effect. And even before it was in effect, they couldn't complete it because they couldn't love God with everything. They couldn't do all those things because they failed over and over again. That is why we need grace. That is why we need mercy because we can't do it in our own strength. When you teach that Jesus has done his part, now I must pray the magic prayer to do my part. That is a contract or a quid pro quo and not a covenant. And again, that's a quote from Don Keefley. Never doubt that you have the ministry of reconciliation, which is to tell all that they are included and accepted, not to tell them that they're lost and undone. The unconditional all of the gospel, that, incl that includes everyone and it includes everything, as we've seen right throughout this series. And I want to, to touch on a number of alls uh, just to finish up. And this is the last session of this series, promise. So I want to finish up by just talking about the alls before I go on to look at immortality and it, its uh, nature. So all. The finished work of Christ has accomplished everything necessary for our complete salvation. Everything. Nothing else to be done. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all the promises of God find their yes in him, in Jesus. That is why we utter the amen. We agree through him to the glory of God. All the promises and the covenants of God are fully and completely fulfilled in Jesus. There is nothing and nothing else, no one else who could complete them or fulfill them. And we enter into that now. We are included in Jesus, as is everyone else. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since by a man death came, Adam, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead, Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. All will receive life and all have received life. All do not know that life, but all have received it. Everyone is alive. Everyone is born from above. It is our ministry to help people understand that reality. It's all our ministry. We are all ambassadors of that amazing inclusion that we all have in Christ. So Adam's all is not more powerful and inclusive than Jesus's all. All died in Adam. All are made alive in Christ. And that thing is to give life. All have been given life. It's not something that will happen in the future. It's something which has already happened, which people will become aware of in their future. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, these are the usual Bible verses that are used um, when people are telling you, you you're not good enough and you need God. Now, the reality is, yes, all have outworked their lost identity and that lost identity is short of the glory God intended us to have in our identity. So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, carry on, verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. So that all who have sinned and fall short of the glory of the God have been justified as a gift by his grace. All. Now, I never, ever saw that or never heard that preached. It will always stop with Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23. That was the two that went together that God has saved us. But all have sinned. And when we look at that, therefore, the all who have sinned are the all who have been justified. Another work that Jesus has done for us. All have lost their identity and all are justified as a free grace gift 
Now, that is good news, and that is the full gospel message. You can't have one verse without the other, because the same all applies, and it's both past tense. All have sinned, and all have lost their identity, and all have been justified as if they hadn't lost their identity. That's a legal term which justifies somebody so they're not guilty, effectively, innocent. Romans 5.18 for then, as through one transgression, Adam, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Same all. Now, what does condemnation there mean? It's not what we think it means in that I'm condemned for eternity in hell. It is I'm condemned to live a life of lost identity unless I know the truth of my justification. So most people are can, are still living in a state of lost identity, a state of condemnation, if you like, a less than kind of life. But the same all are the same all who's been justified. Condemnation is continuing in the independence of lost identity. It's not a threat of punishment. It's a threat of if you carry on without Jesus, you're going to live a life which is much less than God ever intended. So the Greek word katakrino, often translated condemnation, actually means penalty and refers to remaining lost now, does not refer to being condemned and sent to some version of hell in the future. Now, look at this in another version, Romans 5.18. So then, as through one offence, the result was condemnation to all mankind. So all mankind were condemned to lost identity by choosing to walk in independence of God. So also through one act of righteousness, the result was justification of life to all mankind. It doesn't leave anybody out there. Condemnation is not future punishment, but the penalty or consequence of living in lost identity to live a lesser kind of life now. This is a, a present understanding of our experience if we're not living it in relationship with God in the rest of love, joy and peace. OK, some of the things that Jesus said about all. John 17, 2, just as you gave him authority over all mankind, so that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So God gave him, Jesus, authority over all mankind, the same all mankind who were condemned in lost identity and the same all mankind who would be made righteous and justified. So to all whom you have given him, and that's all mankind, because it just says that he's given him authority over all mankind, to all you have given him, he may give eternal life. Now, people will separate those two alls. Well, yes, he has authority over all mankind, but he's not giving him everybody. No, the same all. All mankind he has given to him and therefore that he may give eternal life to all mankind. Again, good news. And that is to know him, to know the reality of who he is, to know his unconditional love, to know that he's limitless grace and triumph and mercy. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. Again, Jesus, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth visible invisible thrones dominions rulers authorities all things have been created through him and for him verse 17 he is before all things and in him all things hold together and that is the inclusive all nothing left out of that all verse 19 it was the father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him verse 20 and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now, this is what he did to all. He's reconciled all and everything that he created, he has reconciled. And that is not just people. That is everything that he created. If you go back and you look at where it started, he's talking about creation. He's talking about all things that were created and therefore the same all things apply in this thing.
Now, Jesus talked a lot uh, in an inclusive manner. John 1, 7, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. And that's talking about John the Baptist. And Jesus was the light. So all might believe through him. All. John 1, 16. For of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Now, most people just do not know that fullness, but we have all received it. John 3, 35, the father loves the son and he's entrusted all things to his hand. All things. John 5, 28, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. And that happened. When everyone heard the preaching of the good news, when Jesus went and descended into the grave and all heard that good news. And he led captivity captive and emptied all that were there. Ending the separation that in, was included in Sheol with the two aspects of it that were separated where we, we hear that story. But the reality is they're now brought together in one. John 12, 32. And I, if I'm lifted up from the earth, put on the cross, will draw all people to myself. Now, all people. That doesn't leave anybody else. There's a lot of alls included in a lot of the things I've said there. You know, and it really is important that we embrace that. You know, there is a lot of alls to embrace. Every little bit there is really important that we embrace the all. Matthew 5.18 and I want to just finish the all bit on this verse. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of the letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, this, if you look at on face value, you think, oh, heaven and earth is still here. Therefore, the law is still in place. Therefore, I must operate under the law. But actually, heaven and earth in this verse were the name given to the temple representative of the old covenant system and when AD 70 came heaven and earth were removed because heaven and earth was the nickname for where heaven and earth met within the holy of holies in the temple and so the law passed away we know the law has passed away because in hebrews it very clearly says it became obsolete and passed away so in reality all has been accomplished well what was accomplished the finished work of christ has accomplished everything necessary for our full and complete salvation. Everything necessary. There is nothing left. Everything has been fulfilled in those alls. And I want to encourage you to embrace that, meditate on it, embrace the reality of all, the all inclusive, unconditional love of God for everyone and everything. Now, in contradiction to unconditional love, I've heard that some people teach that God has plans for us that include all the bad things that happen to us in our lives. And you know, I've had this question, you know, a number of times regarding, you know, a scroll that we have that has on it everything that's happened in our lives. And we must have agreed to all the bad things. And we came here with this scroll for terrible things that would include sickness, pain, abuse, trauma, sorrow even death itself. Now, that is in total contradiction to the unconditional love of God. And I absolutely 100% do not believe that and would certainly refute that truth because it isn't true. Some say that we accepted a scroll that included all the negative things before coming to earth. Therefore, we must have accepted all that has happened in our lives, good and bad, as God's will. Now, I think that is something that totally misrepresents who God is. I do not believe that God, our loving Heavenly Father, even intended anything bad to happen in our lives. All his thoughts about us are good. His intentions for us are good. It is fate to believe that God is sovereign and therefore everything that happens must be his will. Because he operates within giving us freedom to make our own choices. And the consequences of those choices are not something that he wanted for us. And mercy will overcome those consequences if we embrace mercy. Jeremiah 29, 11, a very well-known verse. 
which is not directly speaking to us, but I think it does give us a direct understanding of what God is like. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God is love. God is good. So our scroll reflects that truth. So what is our scroll? Well, it's the record of who we are created by God to be. It is our identity. The scroll of destiny reveals our identity and how we outwork God's desire and intention in our lives. The scroll of our life is the record of what we do as sons of God. Now, there may be a disconnect between the scroll of our destiny and God's desire for us and the things that we actually do. But this is not talking about sin because we're new creations in Christ. We're not sinners. We're saints. We're made righteous. So what is it talking about? Well, there's a number of Bible verses that talk about scrolls. Um, one, Psalm 40, verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book. I delight to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. Now, that was obviously talking and referring to Jesus, but it's also referring to us. Um, so it was written of me in the scroll of the book. I delight to do. Well, Jesus came only to do what he saw the father doing. And he didn't come to be under some external law. But the love that was in his heart, the law of love that was in his heart. Romans 5, 1 talks about a scroll. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. Um, now, I believe that God has created us and made us to be the person that he wanted us to be and we're then born into a world that somewhat messes that up. But his original desire and purpose is encoded within the DNA of our spirit. And our spirit can reform that image into our whole being when spirit, soul and body become unified and one. So Psalm 139, 13 says, for you created my inwardmost parts. You know, you could say he created our heart he created our personality who we really are our redemptive gift or part of that you wove me in my mother's womb i will give thanks to you because i am awesomely and wonderfully made wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well is that true it might have been true for the psalmist is it true for us does your soul know it very well because your spirit knows it absolutely but does your soul know? Is there a disconnect between your spirit and your soul? That disconnect is what needs to be unified. So the spirit and soul can become one unified together and not operating in a disconnected understanding. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my formless substance and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. Now, again, some people will say, oh, there's a certain number of days that are ordained and then we're going to die. It doesn't say that. It just says all the days. Well, there's no end to the days from God's perspective. How precious are, all, are also are your thoughts for me, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And there's this whole sense here that God is inspiring the psalmist in this thing to share and reveal this amazing understanding of who we are, who God made us to be. And we can come into that knowledge and know the truth of that and become an outworking of that. And that is what our scroll is all about. Our scroll is not a whole list of instructions of things we need to do or else. It is a revelation of who we are that empowers us when we are at rest in being who we are to outwork and flow from us. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. Now, this isn't works. This isn't dead works. This isn't works to earn our salvation, to earn God's favor and blessing because we're good and we try and do it and we try and be obedient. This is the things that are good, things that outflow from the fact that we're created in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship. 
that God has already prepared who we are so we can walk out the reality of who we are and express who we are to the world in which we live, to be an expression of that goodness, to love one another as he's loved us, to reflect his love in a world that desperately needs it. So these good works are in perfect alignment with how we are made, i.e. our identity as sons of God. They're not a prescriptive list of things we need to do, but they are revealing who we are, that then when we just are ourselves, will enable us to outwork who we are in this world, in the things that we do that are reflecting our Father God, because we're sons. The outworking reflects God, our intended identity and redemptive gift reflect his heart and his unconditional love so the outworking of who we are reflects god he gave us this intended identity and he wanted us to be like him we're made in his image and likeness but we're all unique we're all wonderfully made we're not copies or clones we're all individually made each a facet of the multifaceted God that we love. So we will see the things that the Father's doing aligned to our identity. The Father will not show us things that are uh, that align with other people. He won't show us those things. If we're looking at what other people are doing and trying to do those things, then we're trying to be like somebody else. We should not try to do what other people are doing. We just need to be at rest in who we are so that we outwork the things which are aligned to us jesus only did what he saw the father doing he had a relationship with the father he was in the father the father was in him they were doing this together in relationship and that's what sons of god are designed to do our scroll is not filled with a list of prescriptive good works but it's a revelation of who we are and how we have been made with our redemptive gifts and our identity our scroll is a revelation of the Father's heart and desires so we can cooperate with him. Our scroll of destiny is not a guarantee, but an opportunity to cooperate with the Father as a son. Now, we've all missed opportunities. We've all had some mixed motives. What happens then? If the scroll of our life is not actually as the scroll of our destiny is supposed to be, what happens? Well, this is what happened to me, and it's an outworking of 1 Corinthians 3.11. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if um, anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay or straw, each one's work will become evident for the day will show it because it's to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each one's work. So the scroll of our life is the record of the outworking of our new creation life in Christ. It's not a record of our lost identity because that is completely gone. God has no record of our lost identity. He keeps no record of any of it. Neither should we. But it is a record of our life as a son. So the wood, hay and straw are the things we may have done with mixed motives or the things we may not even have seen and therefore didn't do. And when I embrace this, I was on the father's lap on the throne of grace and I was enjoying his amazing love and the spirit of the fear of the Lord came past and the father said, do you want to see your scroll? And I thought, oh yeah, I want to see my scroll. Now, perhaps oh, sort of regretted it a few minutes later, but that's what I said. So the spirit of the fear of the Lord had this scroll sealed front and back, gave me the scroll and then led me to this area this cave with it should appeared like it which was black um, and i walked in there feeling somewhat uh uncertain and actually quite fearful and i was quite shaking and ultimately i went before the father and the love of the fire that came from his eyes and he asked me to open the scroll and the scroll opened and I saw all the wood, hay, straw, gold, silver, precious stones. And there was no condemnation. There was no guilt. There was no fear. There was just mercy. And the fire of love came from God's eyes and consumed all the wood, hay and straw. And there was nothing other than gold, silver and precious stones. And then the uh, long story short, the scroll was flipped over 
And I saw all the things that I'd missed opportunities in doing. And again, I felt no condemnation from God. I felt no, nothing of his disapproval, just love. And he just consumed all of those things so that my scroll had no record of those things in my life. Now, our scrolls contain God's desire for our immortality, not our death. And immortality is not just about life, not ending. Therefore, it's quantity. It's also about the eternal quality of life and the abilities that that life unveils. Those qualities relate to our ability as sons of God. So God has made us to be uniquely, wonderfully, individually his sons. And he made us not to die. And that was his intention, that we would have an ongoing, continual relationship that would never end. Now, he has made it certain that we will be restored back to that face to face relationship with him. Ephesians 1, 4. But we're in this sort of transition. Of coming into the full reality of everything that God intended, and that also means our immortality. So the qualities that he has within the quality of our lives are the abilities that we have as sons of god so discovering the truth of our true identity as sons of god comes from our relationship with our loving father it's not something we can strive for it's not something we can work towards if your identity is coming from what you're doing then when you can't do it anymore you won't know who you are if your identity is coming from who god says you are no matter what you're doing or not doing, you're still the same person. So on my journey, the father revealed to me my capacity for non-linearity in my thinking and non-linearity in my functioning and multidimensional living. So non-linearity and multidimensional perspectives of reality renew our minds to operate from a totally different framework. You know, I could not have imagined or thought what this would do in expanding my consciousness to be able to be aware of things from a totally different framework of life. We can be untethered from the limitations of time and space, become free to live as multidimensional beings. Now, we all know that we live in a physical dimension. We have a body that facilitates that, but we also know that we have the capacity to think outside of that, to dream, to imagine beyond the limitations of the physical dimension. Hence, we have a lot of things that people have uh, written, um, made sci-fi films, which are way, way beyond the physical things that we can just purely see because they're creative and our imagination has the ability to go beyond. We also have a spirit that can dwell in and explore spiritual dimensions. The physical body is an earth suit created to occupy this physical dimension, but not to be restricted and limited to it. Our spiritual bodies are designed to occupy the spiritual dimension and also to be able to clothe our physical body in glory, light energy, so that our physical body can also travel and experience other dimensional realities. As we mature or ascend higher, we will discover that we have creative abilities far beyond what we could have imagined or even thought before we set out on this journey. We have the ability to live multidimensionally, not just in dual realms. Now, I began by being in on heaven and in earth. And I was in heaven in the spirit and I was on earth in my body and soul. And I was connected quantumly, connected with entanglement. Therefore, what I was doing there related to here, vice versa. But I was in one place here and one place there. Now, Ultimately, I began to travel and be in more than one place in both dimensions. And the traveling dimensionally and in time became something that I discovered that I had the ability to do. Now, we're all in a creative process that is taking us beyond being merely human. That it, this is restoring humanity from its lost identity into the mankind made in God's creative image and the mankind that has been restored redeemed and justified made righteous so that we can embrace and en encounter all of this we are becoming godlike as sons of our heavenly father who is limitless so we can embrace our full potential 
So the father said to me, it's time for true reality in multidimensional living so you can fully enjoy the bliss of rest from your labors by learning to just be. Now, I could meditate and I did meditate on that for a lot of time and I still didn't get it. I didn't get what he was trying to say, um, but I never give up. I just treasure things in my heart and I got the fact of, well, it will be blissful to be at rest. And I didn't quite understand what my labors of learning was, but I discovered that all the things I learned to do by engaging heaven were laboring to enter that rest of being, to just be. And the father went on, I have shielded you from the knowledge of just what you are as a non-linear, multi-dimensional being. Um, and that is important, you know, and because if I had known I would have tried to do it or work out how I could do it. And that's not possible in my own strength. So he hid from me some of the knowledge of what I was doing from a non-linear, multidimensional way and what I was accomplishing in the spiritual realms by just giving you small glimpses. So he gave me small glimpses that gave me limited understanding that was beginning to expand my belief system my consciousness to accept more that was coming. I will take the blinkers off your mind so your consciousness can expand to take in multidimensional reality so you can truly appreciate your capacity as a mature son of God. Now, I believe God can do this for all of us. This is the immortal quality of our lives. And God was trying to show me that I was not limited to what I could see or feel or operate in, in one dimensional way of thinking. So in that moment, and so this was a process, it didn't just happen in one go. So in the moment that God said that, I began to embrace my desire to encounter that. So in my meditating and embracing it, then in in a moment i became aware of who i was that happened to me as an experience built on all that god promised that was going to come that i treasured and i began to brood over it began to become pregnant in me and eventually it was brought to birth and that's the sort of process that god does in my life he says something i don't get it i meditate on it that begins to to grow it begins to form and eventually comes to birth. So what happened in that moment? Um, well, what happened is I began to become aware of what I'm doing at higher levels of consciousness in an expanded state of reality. Now that sounds all weird and a bit, you know, out there, but that's the only way I could describe it. My mind expanded to begin to perceive what I was capable of being in multiple places at multiple times doing multiple things so i wrote i am therefore i exist in manifoldness like my dad in non-linear quantum moments that are the fulfillment of my destiny now a quantum moment is a particle of time the smallest particle of time that can be every time and it's not a second and another second or a microsecond and it is within that moment, all moments exist, and therefore you can live from a perspective of expanded moments. And we know I've given testimonies of contracting and expanding time and all of this stuff. This was a way of being, a way of thinking that embraced what this meant. Now, I can't say I understood it all at the time, but I began to get some experience of it. And I began to realize that my capacity for understanding it was beginning to grow so that I was fulfilling my destiny in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm. But they were totally connected. And in those moments, I began to see all the things that I was doing. So I became aware of the amazing scope of who we are as sons of God, what we have capacity to become non-linear multi-dimensional beings unrestricted by the limitations of time and space i am within i am therefore i am in multiple places doing multiple simultaneous things now 
before my mind got deconstructed and I began to have the capacity to think non-linearly, and before I was engaging in the eternal now, which I couldn't do consciously to begin with, I could only go there in the spirit, eventually I could engage it consciously because my ability had expanded to be able to, in a sense, rest there without trying to figure it out. Because if I tried to figure out living in the eternal now, I would have probably gone crazy. But I didn't. I parked my understanding, I tried, my ability to try and understand or my desire to understand, and I just embraced experience. And that began to change and expand my thinking to be able to take in all that was would have been too much for me. God continued to say, you may not, no, no, actually I'm saying this now, you may not understand all the terminology of what I'm going to share, but all the things that I speak of are places where I have encounters with the Father and the Son and the Spirit that were all linear. They happened in time, sometimes expanded time in a heavenly perspective, but sometimes hours here and met days and weeks there. But they all happened sequentially, one after the other. And I learned to function as a son in the realms of heaven, in all the places that I'm going to share. And this was, you know, 10 years of my life. And so it took time to learn all those things one after the other. And sharing my testimony of that journey is what the Engaging God program is all about, which is there to help people go on their own journey to also discover who they are and express that as sons of God. So quantum entanglement is a term I use to describe the connection between my spirit and soul in different dimensions. Also, my connection to God in every dimension. So when two particles, and this is the sort of scientific technical uh, definition of quantum entanglement, when two particles such as a pair of photons or electrons become entangled, they remain connected even when separated by vast distances. So my spirit and my soul can be in two completely different places, both in distance and in dimension. And I can be instantly without any time difference connected. So that what I'm doing there can affect what I'm doing here and what I'm doing here can engage with what I'm doing there. So I can choose to engage my soul, my mind, my consciousness with where I am and what I'm doing in that realm or in those realms. I can choose to engage it. I don't often choose to engage it that much because I don't need to because I'm at rest and therefore I am content to be seated in heavenly places doing all those things effectively without needing to know but I do know all of the places that I, I, I am in and all of the things I'm doing because I've been there and I've learned how to do them. So Ephesians 2, 6 says, and he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is true whether you know it or not. It's true whether you know it cognitively yet or not. It is the truth because that is something that he has done. We are seated with him in multiple heavenly places. Think about that. You are in multiple heavenly places right now. Now, you may be aware of that. You may have learned to be aware of it. I can become aware of it anytime I choose by engaging my spirit and my soul together because I am connected and entangled within the core of my being, there is a connection that connects me to that realms and those realms in all the things that I'm doing. And I believe as we mature in sonship, those places in which we're seated or enthroned is another way of putting it, increase in number and in levels of authority. We are entangled. So what occurs as it's in heaven affects our on earth life by a flow of revelation, knowledge, energy, life, river of life, amazing truth in the spirit. We are connected. So when my spirit and soul were separated, reintegrated and connected, I have never lived in one place. My spirit never left that realm. It's consciousness. I still have my spiritual container, if you like, within me, where God dwells within me. And 
that is connected to the core of my being. But my consciousness, just like my soul consciousness can engage outside of my physical body into another realm in heaven. So my spiritual consciousness can dwell within that realm and doesn't need to dwell within me because I am me wherever I am and whatever I'm doing in that sense. So quantumly speaking, I have the ability to inhabit multiple spiritual bodies, if you think of it in these terms, to dwell in and function simultaneously in many dimensional realms. So many different things doing many in many different places. It's like I have, let's say, hundreds of bodies and my spirit is engaging all of them and operating simultaneously. So I am dwells within I am that I am who is everywhere and in everything so i'm entangled with i am because i am within i am that i am now that is what i've learned that is what i've discovered that's what god showed me by taking the blinkers off to give me actual knowledge of that reality so i began to see so i'm going to share all the connected places and functions that god showed me that i am in now, I'm going to do this and I'm going to carry on doing it because I don't want to finish here and then do it next time. I promise I'm going to finish. So I'm going to carry on. Each place has a function and operates simultaneously in a synchronized way that outworks my destiny as a son of God. And I discovered all these linearly, but now I'm not operating in a linear fashion. So I am quantum entangled multidimensionally with the eternal now. That is the place where Father, Son and Spirit are outside of time and space. And I can dwell there and engage there. Also, my own spirit, that first love place where God dwells within me, the garden of my heart, a place of intimacy that I've cultivated and developed, the dance floor, soaking room, bridal chamber, which was my first love experience, the Merkaba, the tree of life seven energy gates and all my expanded spirit spheres because i can expand my whole being around areas um, that i am have measures of authority in and i am in all those places engaged in all those places continually in just one of many connected realities so i can think about the garden of my heart and i can engage the garden of my heart right now and i am functioning or i am in the garden of my heart at rest lying down in green pastures with the shepherd of my soul in which he's restoring my soul right now and all i have to do is shift my consciousness to think about and engage it and i'm there and that would be true of the dance floor soaking room which is the place of my destiny being unveiled which i'm dancing with god if you like in a way which reveals who i really am that's an ongoing continual process it's not something that i have to just have done once in the past or many times in the past i am abiding in this so what i'm talking about here is a state of abiding i'm dwelling in all of these realities simultaneously and in all those realities things are going on which contributes to my life and it's not limited by time or space. So I am engaged in the Merkaba. I'm engaged with the tree of life, engaged with the Merkaba. I have those seven energy gates which are receiving life flowing through them. And I can expand my spirit to engage that. So and I and I often do. Whenever I feel led to engage someone, I can do this consciously. If I was ever going to do a conference or anything like that literally i could extend my spirit around the conference arena or the area and i could engage and open my spirit so people could experience and engage with me and then when i ever speak in a dynamic like that and i'm engaged in that dynamic people can feel and draw from me the things that they want me to talk about which is why i go off so so many rabbit trails when i'm in a live setting because i'm engaging people's spirits and i'm drawn by what their desires and needs are and i'll begin to share things which i probably never had any intention of sharing but i do now i practice that um even when i'm doing something like this i do want to engage where people are and engage my spirit with their spirit or give them access to my spirit in doing it so this is all something that you can do 
I'm also quantumly entangled multidimensionally with the eternal now, dwelling in that place outside of time and space, the cradle of life, which is within the heart of the father, a place where I brood and I come into agreement with the father's desires, heart and intention. And that creates in me a opportunity of resonance. So I resonate with his heart. And as I vibrate with the frequency of his heart, I can then engage with the sound of many waters waterfall, which is a place that I have dwelt in for, for many, many years. And in that place, his voice, what I have resonated with within the desire of his heart, I become that voice. I become that frequency. I become the voice of his authority. I can speak of that which he has shown me is his desire in his heart. And beyond that waterfall, in behind that waterfall, there is a chamber, chamber of destiny, in which I have been assigned many quests and done many things. And what I do is when I brood and I come into resonant agreement and I become a voice, I then go into that chamber of destiny and I see where that chamber gives me permission to outwork what it is that I'm doing there. And then I can engage the chamber of creation and light begins to respond when I speak and it forms reality around my life. And all of that is in another quantum moment. And literally, I'm in all those places right now. And I'm continually brooding because I only want to do what I see the father doing. Now, I'm not consciously looking and seeing this vision of the father. My heart is there. And therefore, he can any moment reveal his heart to me. And that will begin to then change my heart to be in alignment with his heart. And then I become a voice. I'm an oracle of his heart. And then when I speak, creation can begin to respond to my voice. That is what God did when he called things that be not as if they are. And each of us can speak if we're in alignment with the father's heart. Now, I can't say things to change the whole of creational reality on my own. That is why there's power and agreement that when we come together in a corporate dynamic, I'm not just talking about in one physical location, but being part of the mind of Christ, we can begin to brood and know the heart of God. And in agreement, we speak together with his voice. I believe creation will respond to us in greater and greater ways. So I'm also quantumly entangled multidimensionally with the eternal now, the throne of grace, the judgment seat, the altar, the fire stones, and where I'm seated on my many thrones in another reality set. So this is another uh, outworking of my governmental authority in sonship. <clears throat> so the eternal now, again, is engaging with God in the now no time space, the throne of grace. Now, I love the throne of grace. It's the place where I can engage my whole being in a way of openness, honesty and transparency about my life with no threat of any retribution or anything. I can be completely honest and open about any struggles or any issues that are going on in my life. And I can take that to the judgment seat. So I can be continually at the judgment seat where the fire of his eyes are purifying my scroll. I can be on the altar of fire where the fire is purifying my heart and my motives. Hence Isaiah, when he said, you know, I'm a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips, a coal from the altar was put on his lips and purified his lips. And his response was, here am I, send me. I'm also continually engaging the fire stones. Now, the fire stones are nine stones, which eventually become 12 stones, which are steps of our ascension into sonship. And they are revelatory of my sonship engaged. And they've been awesome experiences that have continually enabled my life to be transformed. Now, I can dwell in that place. And where I'm seated in many thrones, operating in my sonship in a governmental way, all of those are ho happening simultaneously and I am there all the time. Now, all I have to do is go and engage and I can be on the throne of grace. I can engage with myself there and I can begin to bring my conscious awareness of things here to the throne of grace and embrace being on the father's lap, feeling his heartbeat, knowing that amazing grace, mercy and love that he has for me, being just totally honest, totally vulnerable, totally surrendered 
And then from that place of consciousness, I'm also at the judgment seat on the altar and the fire stones. And all of that is happening simultaneously. So this, this is a huge increase in our capacity of sonship. I'm also quantumly entangled with, with the eternal now, the four faces of God within yod Hey vav Hey, within the, the tabernacle, uh, holy of holies, um, standing in his name, operating from the four faces of my nature as a son of God, lion, ox, eagle, man, uh, priest, you know, the, the priestly function, the kingly function, the legislative and oracle functions, those four functions, the order of Melchizedek, that is who I am. And I am continually dwelling in that his name. Therefore, I have a continual power of attorney. I can therefore use that power of attorney to operate in the court of the councils of the fathers. I can operate in the court of kings, the chancellor's court. I could engage the court of angels. I can engage this governmental legislative place because this is where I find legislation comes from being in his name and seeing from the four faces and then administrating that in the councils of heaven. Now, again, I can shift my focus. I can go and engage the chancellor's court. I can do any of those things, but they're at work from my mountain thrones continually because that's a state of being, not doing. I'm also quantity entangled with the eternal now, the circle of the deep, the 12 high chancellor's houses, the 12 ambassadors of the ages of man, the Council of Seventy in another quantum moment. Now, this is a, another governmental perspective that brings about change and transformation in our lives, where I embrace time as it is, and I then begin to administrate time as my authority within that to bring about changes in that time, to bring about the processes that will bring me into stages of ascension, which is what the 12 ambassadors of the ages of man, it's not 12 ages, going back in history is 12 steps of ascension where i mature into sonship and eventually become an ascended father so the council of 70 is where i have been given permission to bring counsel and court cases to administrate changes in times and seasons in my own life and sometimes in a wider field to administrate things to bring things about in a wider sphere of government now all of those things again is where i dwell I'm not conscious of it most of the time, but sometimes the father gives me a prompting to begin to meditate and think about it. And then I begin to realize something is happening and taking place. So another area of this, I'm quantumly entangled with the eternal now, the court of the upright, the cloak of mystery, the dark cloud, uh, wisdom's heights and the consuming fire of love in another quantum moment. So this is where I engage in the restoration of all things mandate on my life. So I'm engaged in God's heart. I'm engaged in the court of the upright with the uh, cloud of witnesses. I'm engaged in the cloak of mystery, the dark cloud, which is a place that I can surround fallen angelic beings to help them come into a place of restoration. I can engage wisdom's heights and the consuming fire of God's love where people need to be rescued out of the fire because they don't yet know the love of God and they're in that place. Now, this is, again, a continual thing. It's not something that I consciously keep going and doing. This is who I am. And therefore, I'm continually embraced in the restoration of fallen angelic beings and any other things that God has as part of his heart, because it always starts with the eternal now. I don't do this because I want to do it. I do it because the father's heart is revealed and I respond to his heart and I outwork who I am as a son of God in that. So another area I'm quantumly entangled with the eternal now, the beyond beyond dimensional ante room, which is where I engage other dimensions, the constellational portals, which are access to other dimensions out in the constellations and many dimensions in another quantum moment. So part of my destiny and my identity in this has been to engage other dimensional realities and to help in their restoration. Um, and I feel led and called to do that, but I don't have to do it consciously and cognitively all the time. This is something where I dwell. The father opened up an opportunity to engage with dimensional beings who wanted help. And therefore, I continually own a place of being able to provide help. 
I can access through constellational portals and engage different dimensional realities. Um, and all of this is part of who I am. Now, I don't know whether you will have access to this. No doubt you'll have access to do things that are way beyond what I do. And because you're you and I'm me. But this is me expressing what is possible for you. But don't try and copy what I'm doing. Find your own set of dimensional realities to engage. Find where you're quantumly entangled. Mature and grow by learning to do things in a linear perspective. If you if you feel you need to understand this stuff, you know, it's like I was taught how to do this linearly because I've then taught other people how to do this linearly. But I don't believe you necessarily have to do it linearly. You can you can completely just engage in this multidimensionally by your intention and your choice of being a multidimensional the quality of immortality. So I'm also quantumly entangled with the eternal now, wisdom's heights, the ancient past, the four doors, north, south, east, west gate, the earth shield, and the solar system in another quantum moment. So this is who I am in sonship to do with the, the four doors and gateways that God's given me access to, the earth shield, the solar system. These were things that I've engaged with i've engaged with other groups of people in something that i discovered and this is who i am you know i i have to i can just shift to engage the earth shield and sometimes the earth shield engages me because i'm connected sometimes i feel from the earth shield things that are going on i feel of engaging the earth and i feel sometimes things on the earth that are going on i feel in the solar system there's a lot of restoration taking place in the solar system the fallen beings of the solar system, people are working on those beings to see them restored. There's the planets themselves, the frequencies, all of it being restored. Because this is about the oneness of our solar system, where we're in union and oneness with it. So the frequencies of all the planets work together to create, create a harmonious field of life and energy. Another area which is a creational area I'm engaged is with the eternal now, the father's garden, the seven elemental thrones and the creation in another quantum moment. Right from the very beginning of my engaging with the father in his garden, he opened up the possibility and the experience of engaging creation, spaghettification, where I was spaghettified and connected to the whole of creation in a moment. That was probably the first quantum moment I ever experienced. And it was just like beyond my ability to understand it at all but i felt it and i felt creation's grown and i felt its longing and desire for sons and it, it stirred me and it's been a desire of my heart for creation to be restored i've engaged the father's garden i dwell in the father's garden in the pools in the waterfalls i, I dwell there i engage the seven elemental thrones that give me connection to the beings that god has given to help us connect to creation and creation itself in feeling and engaging with it with desire for its restoration and there's just so much more to all this i mean i'm just touching you know with it but there's so much more in sonship to our role in bringing creation into freedom of bringing creation in freedom from its corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of god if we do not know the fullness of our glory our true identity then we'll only be limited to what we can do on earth or what we can do in heaven, but we're called to be multidimensional beings, immortal in both quantity and quality. So my heart filled with joy when I experienced this. I sank deeper and blissfully into rest, but at the same time, I was so excited by this revelation that I could hardly contain myself. I mean, can you imagine in a moment, God showing you all that I've just described? It was mind expanding in that I was able to contain and believe what he was revealing from that is the reality that I am, of who I really am. And the father said, son, see how easy it is to just be. <laughs> now, there's a statement. And it was like, wow, when when this happened to me, it didn't feel easy. It it was just like, whoa, my mind was going round and round. But, in, but also I was at rest in, in the same moment. So it's easy just to be. This is just a glimpse of what it is to be I am, that I am, 
that you will ascend to when you become an ascended father. And I think for all of us, when don't be limited to just the thought of being a good son, God wants us to become co co-creators in an ascended state of fatherhood, which I think, do I understand that? No, but I, it's in my heart. And I know that that is the reality for his intention for us. Son, learn to become aware of multidimensional reality, but always stay in rest, living in love, joy and peace within. Be balanced by the tree of life in the union between your spirit, soul and body. And I always anchor myself within that core of my being to spirit and soul and body being equally in union and oneness and in harmony. And I don't put a value of the spirit or the soul above the body. I equally value every part. And that tree of life brings a balance between soul and spirit. So we don't just get caught up in all the spiritual or we don't just get caught up in all the things in the world around us, but we are balanced and in harmony one with the other. So as, as you expand your spirit's boundaries, practice expanding your consciousness to become more aware of the dimensional realities that you are mandated to govern in. And, you know, I have done that. It's not something that I do all the time, but it's something that I am aware of and and I'm rejoicing and thankful and grateful for all of that. All you learn to do as a son made in our image with creative abilities will equip you to become an ascended father in the ages to come. Son, the true authority of a son is, is realized through surrender, not service. So abandoning yourself totally to just being, which is why I'm not focusing on all the doing. I'm focusing on this is who I am. This is who I am. This is who you are. This is who we are. We are called to embrace this level of expanded awareness and consciousness that limits us from what we've been earthbound in or even heavenly bound. God is unconditional love. That is why we can trust in his faithfulness, trustworthiness, dependability, reliability, cons consistency, constancy, steadfastness, diligence and perseverance. God is good. I mean, that this is the mention of this, the whole dynamic of, of unconditional love. And I, you know, there's more I could probably go on to, but I, I feel that I want to move to something else. But unconditional love, stay in it, embrace it, experience it, go beyond. Rest is that state of being where we are totally trusting in the Father's love, his goodness, kindness, faithfulness, loving kindness. The Father is 100% totally reliable and trustworthy dependable and to rest is to is that state where there is no fear worry doubt unbelief we just dwell abide and rest within that place face to face heart to heart mind to mind so all that i've experienced and discovered has deconstructed my mind thinking beliefs totally transforming my worldview unlocking my identity as a son revealing my creative sonship abilities and I'm absolutely no different from you. You have the same abilities, capacity, same sonship. You are uniquely and wonderfully made and God wants you to experience and know that reality and truth for yourselves. So, you know, I ask the question, have you experienced unconditional love? Are you living in unconditional love? Are you demonstrating unconditional love by the way you live? Do you have this heavenly vision of unconditional love and the reality of who you really are? Do you know the vast sum of God's thoughts about you? Embrace them, pursue them, seek them, and you will find them. Keep knocking, keep seeking, keep looking. Don't give up, but be at rest and let him lead you so that you follow him by walking together with him. So this gets outworked in love, in that experience. So I'm going to just do an engagement and um, just see where this goes. Um, but I encourage you just to come to that place where you rest. You're not trying to figure everything out, but you're open for God to give you a glimpse, perhaps of where you are seated in heavenly places right now. And perhaps where you are functioning in a sonship dimension in heavenly places right now. You know, I don't know what he'll show you, if he'll show you, or if, even if you want to be shown. But let's just see 
as we engage God, what he might want to unveil and do for us as we as we engage with him. So I encourage you to close your eyes, begin to get into a place of rest, relaxing, turn off any agenda you might have and just come to a place of rest. So start focusing on love. You're going to be living loved. He is going to express his love to you. Just start to focus your breathing and begin to slow it down. And as you slowly breathe in and slowly breathe out, you're drawing in that life, the love of God. You're breathing in his love. It's touching every particle of your being. As you breathe in, love is being absorbed into your whole being, spirit, soul, and body. So breathe. Focus your whole attention on breathing in that amazing unconditional love begin to center your whole thought your whole desire on intimacy and relationship with love let God's love touch every part of your being. If you need physical healing, let the love of God, the energy of love, touch you in that place that you need it right now. If you need emotional healing, if you need mental healing, if you just need a touch of that love of God, focus it into that area that you need it right now be still so you can know the amazing love flowing through you through your whole being he's loving you embracing you some of you need a hug you need the father's hug his arms of love around you you can rest in his arms of love some of you need to engage the throne of grace right now. You just need to sit on the Father's lap, let him hug you, hug him, put your head on his chest and feel the comforting rhythm of his heartbeat. And while you're there, resting, surrender. Cast all your burdens onto him. Anything you're worried, concerned about, give it to him. Share your heart with him. Anything you may be even afraid of right now, give it to him. Because in this place of amazing unconditional love, the Father desires to meet your need with his grace and his mercy. Some of you just need to stay in that place and let him comfort you. Let him encourage you. Let him strengthen you. Let him heal you. Let him make you whole. For others, you may feel you want to go further, you're in a safe place. Just begin to think that heaven is open, that you have access through Jesus to engage the Father, to engage his heart. Maybe right now he wants to take you into the eternal now, to take you into the place of non-linear reality within the perichoresis of relationship that's you set the desires of your heart upon it and ask the father to take you 
into that eternal now dimensional realm so you can just be don't try and figure it out don't try and ask questions just embrace what you feel and what you experience some of you i feel need to engage the light of love that place of heart to heart face to face where you can look into his eyes and know his love at a deeper level where he will affirm you affirm your identity affirm the reality of who you really are that he will speak to you right now some of the vast sum of his thoughts about you open your hearts and to begin to listen to what he shares in that realm where you can experience that vast sum of thoughts maybe one or two or more be open to listen and embrace for some of you you desire to see where you're seated in heavenly places maybe you desire to see that multi-dimensional perspective of who you are if that's you just ask the father to open up that realm whether you can see feel perceive maybe it's even beyond your capacity but it will begin to expand your consciousness just open your heart and let him show you what you need to see what you need to feel in this moment seated in heavenly places Just ask, Father, you will expand our consciousness, expand our awareness, expand our capacity, that we will begin to realize that we are multidimensional beings, sons of the living God. Just rest in that place. Just stay in that place of rest whenever you're experiencing right now. You know, you can live loved, free from guilt, free from shame, free from condemnation. You can love living. You can enjoy the joy of life. You can live loving, be merciful, choosing to live, forgive, release and engage in loving others as you've been loved. Just rest in love, in joy and peace. You're an ambassador of unconditional love to a world desperately in need to know that they are accepted and loved. We have a message, an ambassadorship of reconciliation, of restoration, of love. Let's embrace that.